Hola. <laughs> and thank you, Rebecca, for remembering in a very nice way the work when you were a young girl. So it's a real pleasure to be here. And let me see if I can get started. OK. Um, what I'm going to run through, I mean, this is my, my website, the beginning of my website. And it's uh, the work I've done up to the point of the Olympics. You can see the beginning of the Olympics. And I've done a lot of work, a lot of work since then. And I'm going to show some of that, but really the heart and soul of my work pretty much is from that experience in Mexico. I live in Manhattan. Um, I studied industrial design in Brooklyn at Pratt. I grew up in Kearney. I was born in Newark, New Jersey, so I'm kind of a local boy in New York. Now, before I get into any design, I want to talk about kind of things that in my life growing up that have been really important. And uh, one, one thing that's been important was my grandfather. And he was an engineer on the railroad. And um, when I was a little kid, he had a lot of stories. He was a guy that was out, uh, he was out west when Billy the Kid was out west. And he actually knew Pat Garrett, the guy that shot Billy the Kid. So I had a lot of these real cowboy stories. He was in the Spanish-American War. When he got out of that, he went out west to kind of cool out. And so I had a lot of stories from him. And the cowboy ones really were the best. He, here he is in the West, in New Mexico. And I didn't know what design was then, so I thought maybe it's a good idea to be a cowboy. <laughs> I was the kid in the class that could draw. And I imagine that's the case with a lot of you here who are designers. My father was a fisherman, so I spent some time on the Atlantic off the uh, coast of New York. And one of the things that I really picked up from that is kind of a no-nonsense design. I mean, the things that are on the real kind of boats on the water, you have, you have the compass, you have the knots, you have the flags, you have really a lot of things that made a big impression on me when I was a kid. And I, I call that kind of no-nonsense design. And another area that had the same experience for me was working in the factories. And I used to work, well, I worked, uh, seven days a week, uh, seven o'clock at night to seven o'clock uh, in the morning. So I didn't have much social life, but I was able to pay my way through school and so forth. But that was a real experience. I did that for three summers, and I learned a lot in the factories, a lot of no-nonsense in the factories, too. They have their, one thing that I really respected was there are people in the factories that were, they were as good as Messi in football or Michael Jordan in basketball. I mean, they were just really good at what they did. I studied industrial design at Pratt. They didn't teach graphic design in the, um, the undergraduate schools at that point. It was just coming to this country. Uh, so I studied industrial design. I was chosen from the industrial design school to uh, represent the school at a General Motors program. And that was really an epiphany experience because I met a lot of people from really all over this country who were studying different aspects of design. They had a, a graphics program. And I met a student from Yale where they did teach graphic design at, at the graduate school. And um, when I saw, he, he was studying with Paul Rand, when I saw some of the work that was in his portfolio, I knew what I wanted to do. And I, I guess I've never turned back since then. I was hired back at General Motors. Um, I designed the um, Delco symbol for the Delco parts uh, programming. And uh, in that experience, I also was able to use my industrial design training uh, as far as doing system work. Because it was a system. It was necessary to have a system because there were 12, 1,200 different packages that had to be um, under the same system. And we did it. And that was really um, my first job. I mean, it was really incredible just out of school to have an experience to do that. I did my military service. I did uh, advanced infantry training. And uh, I did a lot of work on the map. I was in a fire direction center. So little did I know how much that was going to help me later on as far as understanding and designing maps. When I got out of the service, I stayed in Detroit. I didn't want to continue working at General Motors. I wanted to work in a smaller um, office. And I wound up working at William Schmitz. And they had a contract with the Department of Commerce. And I did the graphics for that. It was a trade show in Zagreb, Yugoslavia. <clears throat> I developed, now this was a, I, I show this early work because it's really the backbone of my whole philosophy of design. 
Um, again, I studied industrial design. I got interested in communication because of meeting someone that studied at Yale. And I developed the icon for this exhibit, which was a hourglass with the sun and the moon shape. The show was about constructive use of leisure time in the United States. And I suggest, well, why don't we make the entranceway out of it? Well, there, there we go. I mean, I probably have never done anything bigger than that, but I had gotten at that point into realizing that communication doesn't have to be flat. And um, we made the, the, the fencing around the, the whole exhibit out of the hourglass shape. I came back to New York after that, and I worked with George Nelson. Um, Irving Harper hired me to do the graphics for the Chrysler Pavilion at the World's Fair. And I really loved working with Irving specifically, and George also. He was a real design philosopher. The fair was actually islands on an artificial lake, so there were different um, parts to the exhibit. This is the Chrysler exhibit. It was for children. And I developed a, um, a hand as, well, I didn't think of it as a logo for the fair, but it was the identifier. And it also gave me a chance to uh, include it in signage that would help people find their way to these different five parts of the um, exhibit. So that was really, I guess, way, I, I was a victim of wayfinding at an early age. One thing that came out of that was um, the fact that I had worked in the factories, I knew a lot about factories, and because this was a, um, an exhibit for kids and was on auto making, I thought, well, the kids should know about some of the things that go down in factories you have to pay attention to. So I did a series of safety posters, and I, I developed a little guy and then kind of ran him through the mill as far as all the, all the things you, you, know, you had to watch out for in the factories. And from that, um, at the Nelson office, I designed a whole series of these posters that was um, produced and sold by Howard Miller, the clock company. And they actually got back into the factory, so I, I had a full circle going. You come out of the factories, and now I'm back in the factories with posters. Now, it was at that point I had met um, Eduardo Terrasas, who was working at the Mexican Pavilion during the fair. And then after the fair, when we were all done designing uh, the pavilions and so forth, he came over and worked at the Nelson office. I continued at the, at the Nelson office, and I worked pretty directly with George at that point on an exhibit that traveled through Russia on industrial design. But it was during that period I met Eduardo. And um, he mentioned that they were going to have a competition in Mexico. It's a long story, but I'll give you the, the brief of it. Uh, they were going to have a, composition in Mex a competition in Mexico to design the Olympics. He was invited back by Ramitas Vasquez, who was the architect of the Mexican Pavilion in New York. So they were going to work on the, on the, on the Olympics. Ramitas Vasquez became the chairman of the Olympic Committee. So at that point, I had just, um, actually I just met Neela, my wife. She wasn't my wife then, but she just came back from the Peace Corps. And we, I think we dated for about three months and got married. I had met Peter Murdoch in London uh, on a vacation trip. He was studying at the Royal College and we realized that we worked really well together. So Peter came to New York to have a, a year off uh, scholarship and he wanted really to know the Nelson office because of course George was very involved with Herman Miller Furniture. So Peter and I at that point, we were, he, he developed this paper chair called Spotty, if you're familiar with that. I, I was working with Peter during that period. And so we got on the list to go to Mexico. The deal was is that they were going to go out and uh, interview all the leading design offices, but they also were going to invite individual designers to come down to Mexico for a two week period. So we got on the list and our slot on the list was in November, 1966. And that's Neela, that's Peter, that's me. This was in Mexico City. It was our first, first day. It was in the old Alameda Park. And, um, you know, this was taken by one of those photographers that they first they take a paper negative and then they photograph the negative. Uh, so this is a real classic photograph. We didn't know, I didn't know specifically, I don't think Peter knew very much about Mexico. So it was kind of a wonderful experience. Uh, to go there. This was in November 1967. Uh, I still keep my, my instruments. We didn't have computers, of course, at that time. 
So everything was done with uh, compasses or freehand. And I was the lucky one. I hit right at the very end of the two-week period. I discovered that the, the five rings could be transformed or could be generating the, um, the 68, the year of the event. And this was really the beginning of the magic of the whole. And it was a magical experience from that point on. So this is the basic beginning of the Mexico 68 logotype. I took the uh, 68 and then developed the typography around that to make the word Mexico. I didn't really like the typography at first because until I realized it all had to be kind of smushed together, like the 68, I couldn't separate them or they wouldn't work with the uh, five rings. So just by following my nose and realizing we had something that really did look like it belonged in Mexico. And that, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, like I said, I didn't know really anything about Mexico. They didn't teach things about Mexico at that point in New York. So I, I spent a lot of time at the Museum of Anthropology and really discovered some of the wonders of the world. Some of those early cultures in Mexico really created some of the more beautiful things I've ever seen any place, anywhere, uh, anytime. And uh, you can see here the... Uh, the graphic imagery um, in many, many cases had a three-dimensional quality to it, and we took advantage of that with the lineal aspect of the logotype. This is at the, um, the opening of the games, and uh, they never did this again. I mean, this is at, right at the edge of the stadium, so they, um, but anyway, I got a picture of it. And, that's, and then the other part of that was uh, op art had just been really, um, exposed in New York at MoMA. They had a beautiful exhibit on op art, and I just fell in love with so much of that because on flat surfaces you could expose or you could create uh, motion, you could create um, kind of dynamic uh, imagery uh, just through the, through the forms themselves. And like if you take someone like Bridget Riley, and I mean, she's a genius at that. So it was a process of letting the Mexico 68 radiate outward, and uh, this became the look of the games. It became the logo of the games, really, if you will. And you can see, if you look at this closely, you can see the pencil lines on the wall. They actually painted this in different areas throughout Mexico City. And uh, I just really respect so much the, um, the ability to do things with their hands, to build beautiful things in Mexico. And of course, when it radiated completely out, it was the, um, the logo, the poster. We use it in many, 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 many different areas. Uh, Julia Murdoch, Peter's wife, um, did the uniforms, and I worked very closely with her to get the graphics on the uniforms. And of course, you didn't have to have the whole Mexico to know it was part of the Olympic program. We did a lot of experimenting with uh, different things that a lot of this was inspired by things that were in the op art show in, in New York. Uh, balloons with graphics on them. We put the graphic on on the balloons, and these were really beautiful. When you look through them, you had all the moiré patterns of, um, you know, the graphic itself. We we flew these above the different installations, so you could see them on the roadways when you're you know driving, looking for the installations. And I worked very closely with Eduardo on um, the. Milan exhibit, and this was really the Mexican exhibit, and they chose to uh, show uh, at the Trienal the Olympics. And I, I developed this with um, Eduardo, and this is the actual model, and if you take this model at the left, and here where the arrow is, you can see where the entrance is, and this is the actual entrance at the exhibit Milan. So we were really getting into some pretty, um, really, really interesting applications. Now, as far as color goes, um, Mexico is color, and a lot of it comes from uh, the ancients, of course. We don't have a lot of those examples, but we have examples of the indigenous people in Mexico now, and this is an example of a Huichol wool painting, and you can see, I mean, they, they were full of color, and that helped me because uh, I had, I mean, for example, this was the final uh, Olympic issue of stamps, and uh, there was a lot of a very diverse series of um, things that had to be represented. So I just began radiating everything, and it looked like part of the program. With radiating and using color, it was a very interesting aesthetic that was powerful and held everything together. 
including flying in when you look over the, uh, the various installations at a very large scale, we, um, we coated the uh, plazas as part of the Olympics. So from postage stamps to Olympic stadium plazas, it was really a helpful device. Now that was one part of the, of the Olympic program and that was really important um, in a lot of ways, but I think for me and for the rest of my career, um, one, of, one of the really important experiences was working with the, what had been traditionally established at this point, developing a, um, a way of identifying the different sporting events. And I have to say this, the way we did it, um, I didn't originate this. This was originated by students that, was, that were working on the program before Peter and I got to Mexico. And they had their own program, and it was Ibe Iberoamericana University, and I think it was one of the first design schools. And what they had uh, started doing, and this was based on more of the glyph systems, again coming out of the uh, pre-Hispanic culture, uh, focusing on a part of the body or a piece of equipment. And they obviously, they didn't have the experience to really refine these, so I did about 80% of the symbols, but the concept there was, was there. And... Um, this is, of course, is part of the equipment or part of the body and a piece of equipment for track and field. When water was involved, I, uh, I added an indication on the background of the symbol cutting into it, water. And again, here's the, uh, the glyphs, and there were a lot of examples of different glyph systems that came out of the, out of the various uh, pre-Hispanic cultures. Um, okay, so one of the things, let me just tell you three things that we were mandated to do. One was to use three languages, uh, Spanish, French, and English. Uh, the other was to use the five rings. We had to use the five rings. And I remember Ramitas Vasquez uh, did a little doodle of a guy sitting under a cactus with a tequila bottle and a sombrero pulled down. He says, this is not what we want to do. So, I mean, that was basically the whole, uh, the whole thing, you know? I mean, and we tried not to use any language. Uh, the signs had... I mean, using language is, is great, but if you only use three languages, what happens to people that come from China or, or you know, Japan? You can't do it. You can't multiply no matter how many languages and make it effective. So we tried to make the graphics effective, and I think this is one of the things that really has this program hanging in there because we, we, we did this effectively. And I, I love this. You know, in 1968... <laughs> But you know, in 1968, uh, it was traditional that the Olympics were navigated with icons. Now we navigate our lives with icons. And back in that period, people would say, you know, well, for the Olympics, icons are great, but for anything else, they're for illiterates. And I knew, I, my gut told me that was not correct. And thank God, because I, I hope, I, my whole career is kind of built on that one. Other, other parts of the program, um, for, for example, the Greeks use the, the black silhouettes so many ways uh, in showing their athletes. And I, I just updated that the way we look. And I had to do a series of stamps. Well, I did, I did a lot of stamps. But the first time I had to do stamps, it was a series of um, um, the different sports. And I had no registration. I had two colors to work with. And... Um, the idea of the silhouettes made a lot of sense because I could, I could overprint the background, drop out the Mexico 68, and then just overprint it with black images. And then by taking one stamp and putting it next to itself, I could get motion going through the stamp sheet. And this in itself became um, an interesting part of the image that came out of Mexico. Now the silhouette stamps were important, but the silhouettes were really quite important. Oh, another one. <laughs> Actually, I show this because I had a kind of a, a moment driving up the West Side Highway in New York back in 2004, and we were in a cab, my wife and I, and I looked out and I said, wow, why, why are the stamps out there? I mean, I, I really thought I was looking at the stamps. <laughs> I love showing these to the Apple guys. Now, you know, getting back to the silhouettes, though, uh, I mean, Apple did use them in a different way than sporting um, stamps. And uh, we used them as a way to put information on the signs and on the tickets that was extremely straightforward and lit literal that uh, we hoped would work, absolutely eliminate those three languages that we had to work with 
and we hope they'd work for any language. So, for example, um, if you had, well, f as far as the words, Mexico is a proper name, Estadio is a proper name, October Day, October is a proper, you know. So we kept we kept the the, the typography, if you will, the the, the, the naming uh, to that type of an approach, and the sport was never said in any of the three languages. The symbol carried that. And the green ticket, here's where color coding became real because we, we had a color for every sport and every stamp, but it wasn't really color coding. Those of you who work with color coding, when you get into 19 colors, forget about it. You're not coding anymore. You're, you know, you're using color. Um, so, but with the tickets, we had a, a, a way of color coding enough where you could know that if you had an olive green ticket, your, your events took place on October 14. And then from there on, the stripe let you know, uh, once you knew where you were going as far as the Estadio in this, state, in this case, you knew what area to look for in the Estadio, in the stadium. And you were looking for entrance number 13. And when you got to the stadium, the blue um, would give you entrance number 13. In other words, the blue stripe was the color coding of the entrance. The icon and the number gave you what to look for. We did not have any complaints. And I, I, I think that this might be one of my most effective um, examples of design. I did this with Beatrice Cole. Um, Beatrice uh, is, is French, Mexican. And actually, she was an assistant, assistant to Cassandra before she uh, came to Mexico. So I had some good help. Now, after the Olympics, I stayed on in Mexico and had the opportunity to do the graphics for the Metro. The Metro was initially uh, supposed to be in time for the Olympics, because, but because they ran into technical problems and archaeological problems, it was delayed. So it took another year to have uh, the Metro be completed. Now, looking at Mexico, the Zocalo, or the center part of the city, it goes back into the ancient times when Mexico City was a lake. Uh, the Zocalo is still kind of there. Uh, so I took the Zocalo form and then cut into it uh, the lines of the M, rounded off that upper right-hand corner, and this is the logo for the metro in Mexico City. The three lines has significance because it was designed initially as a three-line system, besides it being the M. Um, all the trains are orange, so I used orange as the color for the M. Now, here's where my hunch that icons uh, could do a job besides help illiterate people and, um, you know, Olympic sports. And what we did, we, we researched each of the stations that the Metro was stopping at and developed an, um, a, a visual way of identifying that particular station. And you can see that upper right-hand uh, curve of the M tied it into the metro, but it also gave, uh, gave me a good way of putting these together in close proximity and having a visual uh, separation. So this is the map for the first uh, line when it was in operation, and then the other two lines you can see they were coming after that. Uh, this is um, my, my staff. And uh, this is Pancho and Arturo. And this is the way we worked. I mean, everything was done by hand. We put, uh, as we had an idea, we put it up on the wall um, and went from there. We designed the icons <clears throat> for the first three lines. Now there are 12 lines. And they carried on the system, and uh, it works. Uh, the map's a little more complicated. Actually, I'm, um, I'm not showing any of the work because I can at this point, but um, I'm going to um, have more work that has to do with this program uh, in Mexico for the coming year, 2018. So I'm very happy about that. Now, the, the idea of putting icons out on the street is, is, is kind of a good idea, too. I mean... It ties into what the station history is, and they're very easy to spot from a distance. And they survive very well in a very complicated environment. I use the, uh, the same system that I developed for the, uh, the tickets and the stamps for the Olympics, 
to identify the various uh, um, you know, things that people had to know, exits and so forth. The typography was an interesting experience. I mean, obviously, I didn't study typography. <laughs> and um, after, after doing the Mexico program, I realized that typography really was one of the basic aspects of a branding system. And what I wanted to do is do an architectural typography. And I knew that condensed faces, just from testing these uh, letters, didn't work as well as more of a square face. You could read it at an angle. Um, so this is the typography. And one, one of the things that I tried to eliminate, and I, again, I, I'm not in love with uh, diagonals in letters, so I tried to get rid of them as much as I can. I always think that when they got to the end of the alphabet, they ran out of ideas and had to kind of pop in all the diagonals, and I tried to get rid of all of them. So. Here, here you see the type in, in, you know, in the line of the station. It fills up the whole line. There's no ascenders, descenders, you know, and that and the icon gives you a very, without, you know, going too wild, gives you a very clear way of identifying the station when you come into the station. These are the original lines, and this was the last, my last trip down to Mexico. So. You know, it's held in there and it works and I have no idea why it's uh, so, it is legible. And with all the, you know, testing and everything that's done with legibility, road signs and everything, um, you know, I try to not talk about that because I don't know why this is legible. They're celebrating their 48th um, anniversary. I did a logo for that. And uh, so that's 48 years ago. Now, when I came back to New York, I'm going to show you a few things because, like I say, uh, that program and the Olympic program is really the soul of my work, and I've applied it in a lot of different ways, a lot of different areas since then. Bill and I did the uh, uh, mapping for the Washington Metro, and that's the system map. I recently redesigned the system map, um, and they brought a, a line, they call it the silver line coming in from Dulles Airport. And you can see the same landmarks on the Washington Wall and everything. I maintain all of them. And this was fun to do. And now with the computer, it was uh, really fun to keep everything as accurate as we could, as I could. There's a recent book uh, that I like because I taught for 40 years in New York. And I know how hard it is to teach a student what a concept is or to have a concept and to have the luxury of a process to get at a final result. And this is a book of, of uh, my process. And I actually enjoyed looking at this because I, I forget a lot of the things that I went through. But the, the idea of having a concept, going through a process, and getting at a final result is very, very hard to teach. And I really hope that this book can help students. And it was, it was published by, um, by Unit Editions in London. And it has, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the early things that led up to things like this. Uh, I, I, I love my Minnesota moose. And these are, <laughs> these are some of the, uh, the early. And again, we put things on the wall in the studio. And sorry that he's not at the zoo anymore, but um, he's one of my favorites. And from that, I developed a typography and entrance signs. We, did, we tried to integrate uh, the nature of the zoo in the typography, so we, we call this guy the guide bird, and then all of the major trails, um, I integrated imagery from that particular trail. It was chosen by Time Magazine as one of the best designs in the United States in 1981, so always been proud about that and for the zoo doing it. Now, just a couple of things that the letters at the zoo combine animals and numbers. And, you know, it's kind of a smush of two things. And this is a third dimension approach at that. This is for the um, South Street Seaport Museum. And I, I, this is one of my favorite things. I took a buoy, which is a navigation instrument on the sea, and uh, you know the kind of sandwich board that is commonly used, and put them together and uh, developed what we call the buoy board. Now this was done 
a number of years ago, and I love that they, they keep it in ship shape. They keep painting them, and they're out there. And, um, you know, this is when they were first put in. They're out there winter, summer, all year round. And this is in Mexico, De Toto. This was in a, a London exhibit just recently to show you what it looked like in the third dimension. They did it in steel. And it, it was an incredible experience to get into this type of scale. For it, De Toto means of everything, and it was for a, a shopping uh, mall. I had a recent exhibit down in Mexico City at MOAC, and um, it was called um, Urban Icons. And these are things from my spiral. I just put them into an urban setting, the exhibit itself. A book was done for that, 11 um, projects in Mexico. I'm very proud of that. And again, another book by uh, Unit Editions. Um, I don't have any books here. I'm not selling books so <laughs> or signing books. I'd be glad to sign them if you have them. But I'm so happy to have these books out there because a lot of the work has a lot of process. And I just hope it's uh, you know, helpful for students. Last things, going back to Mexico uh, and working in the city. The Metro has inaugurated a program to find dogs that are living in the Metro tunnels, refurbishing them, and putting them up for adoption. So I took the, uh, the Metro logo and did, a, did a, a logo for their program. <laughs> so. I'm still doing it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so, um, Lance Wyman, Urban Icon. We're running behind schedule. We'll skip the formal question session, but we're going into lunch. And you know what he looks like. <laughs> you know, you know him now. He knows drown you. Him. Don't yeah. drown him. Don't drown Give him. Give him a little space. Give him a little space, but one more, one more time. time, Lance Wyman. Yeah.